Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about how to get started with So when you go into the game lobby you'll see a list of games that you're in in the right and you hit new game to create a new game. You can hit join game if you're a player joining a game or you hit host game as a game master to create a new game. And here we can put in the basic details of our game such as its name and we can choose some cover art for the game which will be, be shown in the background of the game, and then we can uh, write a description um, of the game here. And players will see this, and then we have an invite code which you share with your players, uh, and that's when they hit play game, they'll be asked for the invite code. Uh, that's all they need to join your game, unless you set a password, in which case you have to give them the password. So we'll load into our game, and it will take a few seconds to load. And then we're presented with this black screen, just a blank map. Uh, and I'm going to start by talking just a little bit about the basic interface of DM Hub. In the top left corner, you have a list of users. Uh, and uh, here it's got just me so far. I'm the DM. It shows this online status. And if you mouse over the user, you can see a few details, like what, what version they're on, as well as some performance statistics. Uh, to, to see if their machine is running DM Hub well. Uh, and then there's this button you can press if you want to get the invite code again uh, once you're in the game to invite players. Uh, and then we have this dice panel here. And uh, I'll, I'll remark that all of these panels, you can resize them. Uh, so I can move this up and down. Uh, and I can even, even drag this so I could put the dice panel above if I wanted. Uh, or I could even close the dice panel if if I'm not interested in having it. Uh, and so uh, so I can just click to to roll dice, uh, and then we see that the dice come up in the the chat bar here, where I can also type and other various game messages will. Uh, I'll also remark that some people uh, some people prefer not to have the 3D animated dice. So in your settings. You have a dice speed option where you can make the dice normal, which we've seen fast, which rolls them really fast. I, I kind of like the slow, suspenseful dice of normal. Uh, or you can even make them instant, in which case uh, you won't see the three dice, 3D dice at all. You can also change the color of your dice. Uh, that'll, that'll appear. And so now that I've made the dice instant, we see that they just come up here, but there's no 3D roll. Uh, and so on the right side of the screen, uh, we have uh, we have a time of day, which will look more interesting once we have an actual map. And then we have a bunch of tabs, which we can switch between. Now, I'll remind you that all of these are adjustable. You can you can add new uh, new ones, or you can you can right click to close the different tabs. Uh, so, for instance, there's no audio panel by default, but in this panels menu where all the panels are, you can add an audio uh, an audio panel, and this lets you play music. Um, panels generally come in on the left side here, but I don't like this squished over here. I'd rather add a tab here, so I'm just going to drag it over here. And then, then I could start playing audio, which would play for all of my players. So we're going to start by looking at some basic options that you have for making maps. So I, I'm going to show you how you can, DM Hub has two main ways to make maps. You can create your own map, or you can download a map image and then you can uh, Im import it into your into your game. Uh, you you can you can also of course get a map that somebody else has created within DM Hub. Uh, so uh, the the first tool I'm going to show you is the terrain editor, which you click on and it gives you all of these different options for terrain. So I can go and uh, I can start drawing. Uh, maybe I want to fill with grass. I can also just hit the fill button, which will hit the fill the entire map with grass. Uh, you'll see these guides here are the edges of the map. And when we say the edges of the map, that means that the players can never under any circumstance see outside of these edges. Uh, but you can, when you draw your map, and we'll show that next, uh, with the terrain tool, you most often want to use this brush tool which lets you, you draw with, with a brush. We'll make our brush uh, a, little, a little bit larger, uh, or maybe, maybe use a different brush. Uh, and we can, uh, you'll see that you can freely draw outside of the edge of the, uh, of the map, 
Uh, and that's actually really useful because sometimes sometimes you just want to go a bit over the edge or sometimes you're not sure exactly how uh, how far the players will go so you can expand the map at any time. And once I've expanded the map, now the players would suddenly be able to see this area. But until you expand it, uh, the, everything outside will just appear as black to the players and they will never be able to never be able to see it under any circumstances. Uh, so when you're drawing terrain, you'll see that we have the, the terrain over here and we have brushes and you can choose your brush and you can also go and edit your brush. And there's a number of brush settings such as the, uh, you can choose the, the size, you can also choose different tips, uh, you can choose the, uh, the opacity of the brush and you can choose whether you want the brush to, uh, to like add to, uh, add its uh, value to what's currently there, or you can just choose um, choose some maximum. So if you choose to add it, uh, it, it, it would be more useful if we set our opacity low. So this is going to faintly draw, but then if we draw multiple times, you'll see that it's adding each time, while using maximum uh, would mean that whenever you draw, it never it never increases it just it just stays sticks with that value um and you can also these values like the opacity value you can adjust it here but i can also click on it here and then it will appear over over here so i can i can easily easily change it as i'm going so uh with with this you can you can pretty powerfully draw draw terrain really quickly i'm i'm not doing a very good job of drawing anything particularly interesting here um, you can also uh, set up, uh, you can also animate terrain, and I'm going to show you how, how we do that. Uh, so I've drawn this terrain, and then I'm going to right click and I'm going to go edit tile sheet. And in the edit tile sheet, we can add like a distortion effect, and we can choose the speed of the distortion effect. We can also give continuous movement to the terrain. So if we want our Order to move horizontally, and this will apply to all of the terrain of that type that's already been put on the map. You can also uh, duplicate uh, a terrain type, so we could duplicate, and now we have two types of water, so we could make them move at different speeds or something, and you can also do some tricks like you can uh, change the coloring or the saturation, so you can change what the water looks like, so now we have, we have two, two types of water. Um, you'll also notice that in in this uh, in this tile sheet, uh, we have some options like is water, and that affects the game's rules. So because this is is water, when a token is on here, uh, the, the DM hub knows that it's water and will apply water rule to this tile. So you'll see that when you draw a map, it automatically applies applies some rules. Uh, another really powerful tool is the building editor. With the building editor, you can you can quickly draw uh, draw houses and other buildings. Um, I will also usually uh, this option snap edits to grid is very important. Uh, if you're using that, it will make it so that your your cursor always snaps to the grid, which is often often good when drawing something like uh, like building. Uh, and so you'll see that the buildings when you draw them. They automatically merge together. So you'll see that our buildings here, uh, they as as I draw, they they just merge. And you can use different tools. So here I'm going to use the circle tool, uh, so I can add some circles. Um, you can you can also use uh, this shape tool so that you can draw uh, shapes of your choice. Uh, you can also uh, if you're uh, fam uh, if you're familiar. With how to use uh, Bavia curves, you can click and you can uh, you can draw a curve by when you drag and and then you can make a nice looking. Right, well, I didn't make a nice looking curve here, but if you tried, you probably. Uh, and then there's another tool for for just easily doing curves where you can just click and it will just automatically uh, aut automatically work out a curve. Uh, you can just freely draw. Um, uh, a shape and it will uh, it will add uh, and then uh, you can use uh, this brush tool which lets you this is really good for drawing like tunnels so you can just draw this and it will it will draw, draw out a tunnel 
Uh, and then of course you can um, you can change the uh, you can change the the tiles and and they they will apply. You'll notice that I I have this mode which is very important set, and this mode is set to floors and walls, which means that. Uh, when I draw, it has this merging behavior, and it just draws walls outside the edge. If I didn't want to draw actual walls and only wanted to draw floors, I could I could do this, and I can freely draw outside. I can also cut down my cut down my walls here and make an open entry into the building. Um, you also sometimes want you you often want interior walls, so you can go to walls only, and then I could, for instance, uh draw something here to wall wall off this area. Uh, now you can uh, the the other powerful tool is the objects tool. And the objects tool it allows you to put down uh, down all sorts of objects on the map. Um, so I'm going to add uh, some rocks. So I search for rock and uh, let's let's find some rocks. Um, so I have I have a bunch of rocks down here. Uh, which I'm going to use, uh, and you'll notice that uh, that they have um, they they come automatically with shadows back to the time of day. We can change the time of day, and it automatically adjusts the shadows. Uh, now, what's some really nice options you have when placing objects is you can hold down Shift and use the mouse wheel, and it rotates the object. Uh, you can hold down Control and uh, mouse wheel, and it uh, it will scale the object. Uh, and what you can also do is you can you can uh, select multiple different rocks. So I've selected all these rocks, um, but there's always one that's actually the selection. But you can hold down Alt and it cycles through all of the rocks you have selected or all of the objects you have selected. So I can cycle through and go through different rocks and easily place them. Uh, and then you can press R for random, and it will apply. A randomized rotation. It will slightly randomize the size of the object, and it will also choose one at random from here. So if I go through and every time I place an object, I press R, it is now just placing me a whole bunch of random random rock, which is a really good way to to, to place a, sort of a, a rubble pile or something like that. Now, something important with objects is objects also have properties. If I click on an object, I can see that object's properties. And we'll see that rocks, every object has what we call the core properties, which include things like their rotation and their scale uh, and some other basic properties, uh, including like the sub layer, which lets you put it above or below different things. Uh, so uh, objects, for instance, come below players um, unless you can, uh, uh, you can put them above characters by selecting this. Um, and they they come above uh, above buildings, so the rock is here. Unless I choose like a lower sublayer, in which case it it is. Below. Um, and so uh, the solid uh, property also controls things like um, the object having. Uh, sorry, the core the core property does uh, whether it has a shadow, so you can turn shadows off objects, uh, and also things like the the length of the shadow. Uh, and the the height, which control, which sort of does control the the length of the shadow as well, but it controls a lot of other things like uh, objects casting shadows onto each other. Uh, now, now every object has a core property; it can't be deleted or anything. Um, but rocks have the solid property as well, uh, like a lot of objects do. And the solid property let you choose things like does this uh, does this object block movement. So if if it if it's a yes, then players would not be able to enter this tile, uh, and it gets the shape of the object and automatically works out which tiles it should it should block. Uh, and then does it block light? Does it block vision? So that means can the player see through it? Uh, and then even does it offer cover in combat, which we calculated. Uh, so uh, and so. Another example of a uh, an object that that you're going to use often are lights, and so lights, uh, and so any object can be given a light. It's just an object with the light property, and you can add properties to to an object here. Uh, so we'll see that this uh, this this light we've put down. Uh, we'll see that we uh, this rock 
uh, it blocks light, so we'll see that the the light does not go does not go past a lot uh, past a rock. Um, and so o o objects are just are just made up of their properties. So you can add any property to any object, uh, and so you can import your own objects uh, very easily. And uh, and when you do, uh, you'll uh, so you, 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 uh, we'll, we'll do an example here of this boat asset pack. Um, and what's nice is if you have an asset pack that is uh, you saw that that was an image that was composed of a bunch of uh, of assets, it breaks them down into individual uh, individual uh, objects. Uh, and so I will just I'll just place them in magical folder. Um, and so uh, you press import objects and it will take a few seconds to import all of your objects. Uh, and then in the folder I imported to, we see all of our objects. And the objects by default, they don't have any, any properties other than the core property. Uh, but you can you can then you can then start adding properties to them, and when you when you adjust an object, uh, if you right click on it and and click save changes to blueprint, that means save changes to the object over here. This this is the blueprint. So you can import objects and you can adjust them to your taste, and then you can you can save changes to your. Okay, next we're going to talk about creating characters. So there's a couple of ways you can create a character. This is the this is a character panel which will tell us our character details. Uh, one way to create a character is you can just right click anywhere on the map and you can go create token and then click character, and it'll create us a new character. And I can click on it and often it'll it'll show us a, a sort of summary of its stats here. Uh, often you want to assign your character to a player, so you can right click. And you can you can put a sign to, and here you'll see that uh, that because I haven't had any players join, it just has GM controlled, and I can assign it still to the players party, or I can assign it to to say that it's like a friendly NPC. Um, and it, it, but once I have players con uh, connected, I could I could uh, assign it to them. So when your player connects, you probably want to immediately assign them a token. Once you have a token. You can you can click on the token to bring up this little radial menu. Um, though I usually like to use the keyboard shortcuts because I find them pretty intuitive. Uh, and the C shortcut is for uh, bringing up the uh, the character sheet. Uh, and so this shows you a basic character sheet. Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, what your character looks like. Uh, and I'm going to give you some tips for some different ways to set up what the character looks like. Uh, so you click on on the avatar here to change what they look like. And we we come with a whole bunch of prepackaged um, avatars, but usually no library of prepackaged avatars is really going to make anybody happy. People always want to want to download an image, get an image, have an image um, made for them, um, whatever. Um, but uh, but it it sometimes gives you a starting point, especially for NPCs. Uh, and then you can also edit the frame of your character. Uh, note that you can set the avatar frame to none if you want to have more of a top-down style token, and that will work just fine. Uh, now, often, especially when setting up NPCs, you want to be able to uh, to customize the image quickly. And so you can edit this and do upload image. Uh, you can also paste image to paste the image from the clipboard. Um, but we have some even faster options, which I really like. Uh, for uh, for setting up uh, your images, one of them is that you can get. I, this is just my file system. I can just get an image and drag and drop it on here, and it it sets it. Uh, and then you still you still have to go into to adjust the like exactly how it's framed and everything. Um, but this is a very quick way to set an image. Uh, another way that you can really quickly set an image uh, is that if you just do search for a dwarf image. Uh, and so you can use the Windows snipping tool, uh, which is uh, Windows Shift and S, and then you can select any area of your screen and it copies it to the Windows clipboard. And then you can just go here and you can just press Control V and it, it sets, the, sets the image on the token. So you can see that there's some different options uh, for very quickly uh, 
uh, setting up setting up images on tokens. And this is especially useful, like I said, if you want to set up a lot of NPCs very quickly. Okay, so we showed that we have a basic character sheet here, uh, and you can edit most of these stats yourself directly. Um, however, we have a character builder which follows the 5e e rules for building characters. Right now, uh, we, we haven't done any kind of like dice rolling for the attributes. You can just roll the dice yourself and just enter your attributes. We'll, we'll, we'll later on, we'll do something nice for this. Um, but then you can set your, uh, your race uh, and you can, you, and you see that now we're a, a dwarf. Uh, it's told us that we can choose tool proficiency. Uh, and it lists all of your, uh, all, all, uh, all of your traits and, um, if everything you get from your race, you can set a background. Uh, and I will note that all of these items, like the race, uh, are all, uh, they all come from the game's compendium, which I'm not going to show details of in this video, but I will say that if you play around in the compendium, you can add your own races or change the existing races, including changing all of these rules. All of these rules are accessible to you, uh, and, and we use the same tool that we use to e edit these as you, you have access to. Uh, and then we can choose a, a class for our, uh, our dwarf, and you'll see that now we have all of these weapon proficiencies, languages, and so forth, farth, so forth are set up. And then we can we can choose some barbarian skills and, and so on. I, I I won't I won't do any more of that for right now. Uh, but and you can see that we have uh, we have our uh, stats set up. Uh, we have our armor class calculated. Uh, you can click and you can get the details of how the armor class calculation comes to be. Um, we get some some basic actions. Uh, you'll see we have some skill proficiencies. We have our bonus calculated. Uh, we can we can click and it rolls. Uh, we would get the three D dice except we turn them off in the settings. Uh, and then uh, we'll see that when we go when we go back out, uh, our character has all of their stats set up, and you can also make rolls rolls here. Uh, I I really like the three D dice, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn them back. Uh, and so uh, so. What you can do is you can press I, or you can click here and click on this to go to the character's inventory. And this brings up the inventory selection. Uh, and you can hit the, the add items button to, uh, to add items to their inventory. So uh, I might want to give them a, uh, a battle axe. And so I've given my character a battle axe. Uh, and now you'll see that they get an action to use the battle axe at the bottom. Uh, I might also want to give them uh, chain mail, which prob probably not a good idea on a barbarian, but um, but humor me. Uh, and so uh, and so this this will adjust their armor class appropriately because they have chain mail. Uh, they have a battle axe uh, action. Uh, so if we were to uh, add an enemy onto the field, so we'll add. Uh, some goblins, so you can just go to the bestiary and search, and we have uh, we have uh, all sorts of monsters in there. Uh, and so our dwarf can now attack the goblin. And uh, and and we so uh, we can click on our battle axe. It shows our range. We choose a target, uh, and then it calculates our roll for us. Uh, and then we can we can click uh, roll dice. Uh, we'll see see it plays a little animation and it calculates and we we miss the goblin. Uh, if we had hit the goblin, uh, I'll give ourselves advantage to try to make us hit. Um, if we hit the goblin, then we get to roll damage dice and uh, and we just hit roll and it does damage. Uh, so you can see that this pretty nicely automates um, some pretty basic things in the game um, pretty easily. Uh, I will also comment that we set up our map. We'll see that our map is has pathfinding. So you'll see that it doesn't let me go um, uh, go through the building. I have to walk around. So you set up your map, and pathfinding is just done for you for free. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the uh, this was water. So we'll see that here we are walking 25 feet per round. Um, if we go here. Uh, suddenly, it shows this swimming icon because we're in water now, so we have to we have to swim. Uh, so next, I'm going to show you how the the combat tracker works. So what you can do is you can select some some characters that you want to be engaged in combat, and from the tools menu, 
you can click Roll Initiative, and this will start the combat tracker. And all of the characters I selected, uh, it will default that they, they will they will roll. So uh, so we we have an initiative roll. We have these guys selected. I hit submit, and what this will do is this will send a request to the controller of each of these creatures to make a roll. Since we're the only person in the game and we're the game master, we're the controller of them both. So we'll get the requests and we'll do them. Uh, we'll do them well. It, by default, it gives us this to just roll all the prompts like it's saying roll roll both the prompts at once and i'll hit roll dice and it will roll for both our dwarf and our goblins um and we'll see that the the goblins got a 17 the dwarf only got a five and so it sets up our initiative tracker uh you'll note that the goblins only have one initiative entry that is a pr a, a preference that you can choose in settings to choose whether you uh, uh whether um uh, the goblins will each individually roll or whether uh, all goblins will roll. Uh, and now you have uh, initiative tracking. Once you're in initiative, uh, when you move a character, like you move this goblin, it actually shows these guides to show how far the how far the character can move. Um, and then when you're finished with a turn, you just hit end turn and then it goes to the next player's turn. Now it's the dwarf's turn and so he can, he can move. Um, so on. Um, so that's that's pretty much how uh, how combat tracking works. Uh, I'll also remark that you can uh, a pretty useful tool is the request rolls tool, uh, which you can bring up with Control R or using this menu, and you can select whoever you want it to apply to. So I've selected this goblin, uh, and you hit request rolls, and you can then say I want them to make uh, you know a saving throw, a Constitution saving throw, DC fourteen. And again, this sends the controller a request. So this is what pops up, and it pops up. So this, if I had selected a player and done it, it would, it would, uh, it would pop this up for for that player, not for me. So this is a really cool way that you can sort of send your players uh, re a request to make rolls, um, and they they just have it pop up. And if they have any like special advantages on the rolls, it'll come up as options for them to to click. Um, I will remark that you can actually grab the dice and hurl them if you, uh, if you want to feel the freely rolling dice. Uh, so and so it rolls and it tells me if they passed or failed. So we can see that he failed, and then you can impose whatever consequence uh, you want. Um, there's uh, I will demonstrate that you can also add spells to your characters by pressing M on them, uh, and this brings up a library of spells. We're still working through the 5e spell list and all of the spells with this weird white icon are generally not not automated uh roll uh, ones with this icon are automated so we'll try this acid splash spell and i'll just demonstrate how this works so uh, we have given him acid and so we can select acid splash down here and you'll see that it invites us to choose a target it has the radius marked uh, and we choose a target and Acid Splash says that you can choose two targets, but the second one has to be within five feet of the first one. So you'll see that once we've selected the first one, the targeting range goes down, to, uh, and so we can select this one. And now both the goblins must make saving throws. Again, this saving throw dialogue would come up if uh, uh, on, on, the, on the player who controls uh, the creature that's targeted. So if it was a player targeted, that player would get, the, uh, would get this dialogue coming up. Um, so I'm going to roll the dice, and we see that well, they both they both made their saving throws. So, and it tells us the consequence that they avoided the the damage, so they don't take any damage. And the damage would I would get to roll for damage, and it would be automatically applied if I had hit. Next, we're going to talk about player vision, and I've gone ahead and had a character join the game and take control of this tool. Demonstrate some vision really. Uh, firstly, you often want to see where where can my player see, and so you can right click on any token, and you can select show token vision, and it will show a perspective of what this what this token can see, um, and we'll see.
Next, we're going to talk about token view, what players can see. I've to demonstrate this, I've added a player to the game and had them take control of this. What you can do is you can right click on any token and you can click show token vision to see vision from their perspective. So we see that this token, they see they see these buildings, we can move them and we can see how their, their line of sight changes as they move. Another really powerful thing you can do is can uh, you can get a quick overview of token vision by turning the player vision overlay on. And note that this will only work if you actually have some some player characters on your map. And what it will do is it will show the area that the players can see. So you see that it is uh, it is not darkened like this is with dithering effect. Uh, and so you'll notice that uh, these these goblins they they are not on the players' party. So if they if they move. Uh, it does not affect the uh, the area, but when the when the dwarf who is a player because they're assigned to a player, when they move, uh, you'll see that they uh, uh, it it does. Uh, and so and so you can you can always turn turn that off and on. Um, and so something something else you might want to do is you can decide that your map this map is above ground, so it has a time of day. Uh, you might decide that your map is below ground. Uh, and so what you can do is you can add the floors and layers panel, which I, when I add it, I usually like to put it, put it over here. And so all of the maps that you create by default, they have the ground floor and they have what we call the roof layer. The roof layer is something that you can put roofs on top of buildings and until the players go inside the buildings or can see through a window, the roof will appear. So that, that is really nice instead of showing this, this dark area. Um, so you can, you can decide that your, uh, your floor is underground by dragging it below this ground line and it will now be considered underground. And now we see that instead of having a day night, it just has this darkness slider and we can make things really dark. Now, of course, you'll uh, remember that dwarves have night vision, dark vision, so they can they can actually see uh, in the dark. Uh, and we have a light here, otherwise the map is pitch black. Uh, you can always turn on GM dark vision, and this will basically give you basic dark vision of the entire map, which is often really useful. But if you want to see things as the players see it, then you, then you can turn it off. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the measuring tool, which is a pretty basic tool that lets you just measure areas. So you can you can click and you can measure things. Uh, one one cool thing to note is that you have this display to other setting, and if it's set, then other people can see uh, where you're measuring. And you could, you'll see that when my line, you'll see when I move it, it goes a lighter color. When it goes that dark color, that means that it's transmitted it to players. Um, and this is good for sort of talking about uh, where distances and and uh, calculating sharing them. Uh, I hope that this has given you a good overview of getting started with DM Hub. Uh, there's there's plenty of things that we didn't cover, and I will try to cover them in later videos.